I'm James Briarton in Charlotte. Welcome to the Carolina Weather Group. This is a live taping streaming on this Wednesday night to YouTube, Facebook, and other platforms. It is Wednesday. February the 22nd, 2023. If you're joining us in a re-air or later on in the week, feel free to also leave a comment. We'll be soliciting live comments for those watching along with us tonight, and we'll be answering more of your questions as we get them throughout the week because we have a jam-packed week ahead for you here uh, right after this taping i'm loading the car and we're getting set to take the show on the road to kennedy space center cape canaveral florida this weekend for the nasa social event uh, nasa and spacex are scheduled to launch crew six to the international space station since we last talked to you last week uh, nasa has decided to delay that launch by 24 hours so they're now looking at 1 45 a.m on early monday morning which for all intents and purposes means that you'll be staying up with us live here in the carolina weather group on Sunday night, and we hope you will do that. Joining us on our Carolina Weather Group panel this week, we got Scotty Powell in Myrtle Beach, Frank Strait in Columbia, Jared Smith in Charleston, South Carolina, and this would not be a NASA extravaganza <laughs> if we didn't bring in Tony Rice, NASA ambassador in Raleigh, who is going to be my uh, personal helper here, Tony. I've not been to a live <laughs> rocket launch. I, I have to pack the car, so I've already admitted that I'm procrastinating. What do I need to grab when I'm done here? Uh, patience and flexibility. Uh, these things get delayed. You've already seen one delay, and that was a, uh, we'll call it a pre-delay, but um, ballpark about 50% of the planned launches from the Kennedy Space Center are delayed. It's generally just a day. Sometimes it's two days. Sometimes it's a couple of months, you know, depending on, on what the problem is. Technical problems can bring up those, those kind of delays, but um, uh, the fact that, it remind me of launch time, it's one something, 1 45 a.m monday morning as of this wednesday night so that is of course like you said subject to change that is subject to change but uh those uh, early morning launches are the most reliable ones because you're generally not running up against the dreaded thunderstorms uh, that can move across the uh the florida peninsula uh and we should definitely talk about launch weather criteria because you're going to be watching that like a hawk uh, that e afternoon and evening as you're uh, you're getting that nap. And I encourage you to do that. Get a little nap that afternoon if you can, since you're going to be out there late. And, uh, and as we were talking about before we uh, jumped on online, know that, um, you know, after that launch, you, you'll probably want to go get a little snack or something like that. Good luck finding something open in that part of Florida on the Space Coast uh, that I late at night. It's It's small town Florida, essentially. It's not where all the New York transplants are. I can't find a diner open at 4 a.m. Uh, not really, no. <laughs> I have lots of questions about uh, this mission, what I need to know, what to look out for during this event, many of which mm -hmm. we hope to bring to our viewers and listeners here in the Carolina Weather Group. But you mentioned that uh, that launch weather criteria. So let me go ahead and put that up on the screen as we are, in fact, a weather <clears throat> podcast. And that is what we're going to be zeroing in on. So like you mentioned, we won't have any of those afternoon showers or thunderstorms, but there's a whole laundry list of things here that I will just read some of for our podcast listeners. But uh, do not launch for 30 minutes after lightning is observed within 10 nautical miles of the launch pad or the flight path. So, Tony, there's two things just in that one sentence that stick out to me. One, 30 minutes. I think this is an instantaneous launch. And two, flight path. We've got humans aboard, so we're not just worried about what's above us, but we're also worried about what's out over the water. Is that right? That's correct. And uh, the flight path is going to take it up the East Coast. Now, when we think about the United States, we tend to, a lot of us have this, this rectangular in, uh, shape in mind when it, when it comes to how the, the U.S. is shaped, but it's really more shaped like a triangle. So the, uh, the, the launch path is taking it up a 37 and a half degree um, uh, angle to the, I'm sorry, 57 half degree uh, angle to the equator, uh, which is putting it in line with the ISS, because ultimately it's going into the ISS. So we're trying to catch up with the ISS and that kind of runs up the, the path or up the, uh, uh, the coast there. And that's why we can see these launches even as far north as South Carolina, North Carolina and on, on further. Um, this one probably will not be visible much beyond say about Georgia um, because we're not gonna be seeing sunlight catching the, the plume. We're just, the only thing that's really visible there is the, the flame. And by the time it gets too far north, but you're absolutely right. The, the path is concerning there. You mentioned lightning is a definite concern there. If we think back to some of the early Apollo launches, that was not part of the, the launch weather criteria. 
they were launching those Saturn V's in rain, and we more or less rebooted the Saturn V rocket uh, because it got struck by lightning. So now lightning is a, a big criteria there. Keep reading through that criteria, and I think you're going to find a few more mentions of lightning. Yeah, lightning is obviously a huge concern for the exact reasons uh, you described. Um, I, I imagine also clouds and visibility. We're going to be watching a little bit of some shower activity, we think, based on the long-range models offshore. What type of visibility do they need when it comes to cloud cover and the like for tracking purposes? Um, they For the earlier launches where it's very critical to get eyes on the, the vehicle uh, because you're, you're testing the launch of the vehicle as well. That was far more important than it is today. This is Crew 6, and there have been many, many, many more Falcon 9s that have been launched before that. So the visibility isn't as critical there. If you could bring that uh, back up, I do want to point sure. another um, lightning item. Bottom left, field mills. So this part of Central Florida, especially Merritt Island, where the Air Force Station is, I'm sorry, Space Force, I'm still not used to that, uh, and the Kennedy Space Center is, is some of the most heavily weather instrumented, you know, couple of square miles on the planet. So one of the things that, in, in addition to all the towers that are um, checking, you know, they have uh, uh, instruments up there that are checking wind speeds, they're checking temperatures, they're checking um, uh, humidity, there are field mills down on the ground. And what a field mill is, it's about the size of a, an old school metal coffee can, and they've got rotating blades inside. It's checking the electrical potential of the atmosphere. Um, they're dotted all over the space center. So there are um, criteria on how much electrical potential there can be in the atmosphere. Because we have lightning coming from clouds is one concern, but the rockets themselves can also generate lightning. More or less, the, the motion of the rocket upwards is generating static electricity that can travel down to the, the ground on the actual plume of the rocket itself. So lightning's a, a, a big concern with, um, with launches. You're going to have less of a problem, like I say, in the early morning hours, I would think. Uh, but I'm thinking back to the last night launch I went to, which was the Parker Solar Probe. Uh, it was a, a probe that's out there right now, literally flying through the corona, flying through the sun's atmosphere. It was launched around that time, one, two o'clock in the morning. We had to come back the next day because of, uh, if I remember right, it was a you know, one of those uh, launch weather criteria was broken. We came back the next day, next early morning, and, and launched just fine. And of course, it's SpaceX who has really advanced the technology, and we see new things that we didn't have with shuttle, they're going to be trying to recycle some of the booster engines, which means they've also got to take into consideration whether at a landing site. And that's true. Yeah. And that for uh, human missions such as this one is less of a concern. They're more about keeping with the schedule than recycling the, um, the boosters often. I don't know what the plans of this particular one uh, is. I would guess uh, since it's going to station, that they're most likely going to try and land it uh, off the shore. Um, just about due east of Jacksonville is where that autonomous ship would be anchored out there. Uh, and uh, that would be where the booster would land. Some of those missions, the ones that are a little more uh, easterly facing, uh, they'll try and land those back at the Kennedy Space Center and a couple of, of uh, landing sites there. Uh, certainly cheaper to do it that way. You don't have to drag the vehicle back in uh, and you know just more or less drive a truck up and pick up your rocket and go recycle it uh, but I'm pretty sure that, that we'll probably try to uh, land that on one of the couple of, of drone ships that got off of the Jacksonville coast. And for folks who are just joining us, uh, we're talking with Tony Rice, NASA ambassador in Raleigh, about this weekend's NASA SpaceX Crew-6 launch to the International Space Station. Uh, I'll be heading down to uh, Kennedy Space Center to hopefully, fingers crossed, get to see that launch. Currently scheduled for 1.45 a.m. early Monday morning, subject to change. Uh, Tony, let's take a step back and, and let our audience uh, understand and comprehend uh, what this mission is about, how many people are aboard, where they're going, and, and why. Uh, you're going to put me on the spot. Let me pull up the. the, the you don't have to name here. them. It's okay. 
It's two oh, Americans, a, a representative from the United Arab Emirates and Russia. Okay. And that Russia seat being occupied there is interesting because there's been a couple of, um, we'll call them challenges, the Russian space agency, Roscosmos, has had over the, the past couple of weeks. Um, there, I believe it was one cargo module and another crew module or, or I crew, believe that's uh, correct. spacecraft. Yeah. Uh, got hit by some micrometeoroids and that is a risk that is impossible to eliminate in space. So it was probably something maybe even the size of a grain of sand, uh, that hits a coolant tube. And while technically feasible, uh, to return astronauts in that particular, uh, spacecraft, it would be far from a pleasant trip home uh, because those that coolant system is there to deal with the incredible heat that is generated uh, during re-entry. So uh, they're, if they have not already launched, we'll be launching soon a replacement craft for that. So it, it's interesting to see uh, a Russian going up on, um, on a SpaceX mission. I'm glad you brought that up because I do think that's a very unique storyline or at least thread as a part of this Crew 6 storyline. Because not only do we have one Russian coming up with us, as I understand it, the Russian crew of three is really also encompassing one American who is would be coming home uh, when Russia can accommodate a safe trip back home. And like you mentioned, they're hoping to get uh, another passenger rated vehicle up there. But um, I don't know if you know this, Tony, off the top of your head, and I'm sorry for putting you on the spot, but I know with crew six, we have four humans aboard. Are, is there additional room in Dragon to bring additional people home if the Russians were to continue having problems getting their own craft up there? It's it's like a parking lot up there uh, on station. And uh, the weekly report that comes out from NASA, uh, from the Johnson uh, Space Flight Center, from the Human um, Space Flight Center there, uh, includes all the different craft that are parked there. So there are generally at least two, uh, sometimes more, depending on you know what the schedule is at the time, uh, human-capable spacecraft up there. There always needs to be sufficient lifeboat capabilities to be able to bring people down should it become necessary. Uh, that's why this incident with the micrometeoroid has garnered some news. Um, the, like I say, in a pinch, they could use that spacecraft if they needed to, uh, but uh, yeah, if something happens, they're going to get them off with whatever spacecraft are up there. Uh, and that might be a Dragon. Um, pretty soon it'll be Starliner, uh, the, the Boeing spacecraft that's going to start uh, bringing astronauts back and forth. And then, of course, the Soyuz. I'm glad you brought Boeing into this conversation, because if I'm not mistaken, that will be Boeing's first human flight to the International Space Station. That's and... correct. There has been a uncrewed um, demo flight, two of them actually. Uh, when the first one didn't make it there, it became necessary to to prove that technology out. That was the whole purpose of that flight. It was a demo flight, and a second flight was flown and uh, went much, much better. And SpaceX has been doing this since 2020, and they took over when NASA retired their own shuttle program in, in 2011. So we're really moving and continuing to move down this path of... Right having private companies uh, contracted out to do these things. I want to bring Jared Smith, Caroline Weather Group panelist, Charleston into the conversation because Jared, as you disclosed to our audience on our last episode, you were at the NASA social event, the same event in name that I'm going to. Uh, you were at the NASA social event in 2011 for the last space shuttle. Mm -hmm. For anybody that missed that conversation, Jared, what was that like? Well, one, it wasn't social at that point. It was just tweet up. It was just tweets. <laughs> Um, well, they you know, it to... Elon Musk owns both Twitter and SpaceX. Maybe they'll change the name back. <laughs> it's very possible. Who knows? Um, so, I mean, first of all, it, it's just a complete geek out for the entire time. I mean, we were talking with uh, uh, Tony before the show started and, um, you know, you get to go inside the VAB, that that the vehicle assembly building. That is just an awe-inspiring experience. That is just an incredible place, and there's just so many details to take in. Uh, you know that that's that's one thing that's massive. You get you know you get to talk to a lot of uh, 
you know, just great people. When I was there for the space shuttle launch, we had uh, several astronauts. We had uh, Bob Crippen, who was uh, one of the test pilots on Columbia's on the on the first Columbia flight. Uh, he came by and talked to us because, you know, last shuttle launch. Um, we had actors. We had Seth Green come by, who's doing things with space. Uh, we have, you know, I mean, it, it, Elmo was there for crying out loud. So, I mean, it was it was really just a, an amazing experience. Um, I will say that it was terrifying being up against uh, thunderstorms. That was definitely our issue. Um, <laughs> we had um, the day before we had a huge downpour in the tent, and and we were in a tent. Huge downpour outside. It was like, well, this isn't gonna. This is. Uh, that's not promising now, is it? <laughs> and um, and it was about 40 percent at that point uh, to go. Uh, they were we were all kind of bracing for like, OK, we got to do this. We were here. It was cool, you know, you know, because some of us, we we couldn't stay. I mean, that that's you know, that's just the you know, that just happens with these. Um, but they found a window the next morning. Uh, and um, and let me tell you, nothing prepares you for the the sound, the roar, how it feels, and how bright it is. Um, shuttle, I mean, I've watched a ton of shuttle launches on TV, watched a ton of rocket launches on TV. Awesome. Does not compare to in-person. Just does not compare. I'll just, and, and if they're putting you where they had us, which we were about three miles away, we we're out by the countdown clock. So if you're going to watch from there, um, I'm telling you, it it is just it's just an incredible thing to watch. And uh, I was always a procrastinator. I'm always a procrastinator. So I was always like, I want to go see a shuttle launch. So of course, I wait until the last one. Um, but I had a front row seat to it. It was it was incredible. Uh, Jared, while you were talking, I don't know if you were able to see what our audience was able to see um, in Restream mm -hmm. Studio behind the scenes here. But I'm oh, going to yeah. go ahead and pop pop it up on my face. And we've actually dug out the 2011 NASA <laughs> high definition video. And I think we can see the exact tent that you were in. If I just kind of fast forward this here a little bit. Oh, yeah. Know. Yeah. That's the. Does, uh... this, does this look right to you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That that very much looks that very much looks right. You might you might find me in there. Hell, I might have somewhere hair. in that crowd is a Jared there somewhere in there i'm i'm in there somewhere yeah i've got a lot more hair than i'm used to i probably i recognize a couple of those people actually from the uh social that was a that was amazing when the uh when the uh when the the shuttle cleared the stratocumulus deck there that was that was crazy that was such a cool glow it was so cool uh but then we all had to watch it on tv because it was pretty much clouded up after that uh so there wasn't much shuttle for us to see but uh uh, there were people in tears. There were people. I mean, it was a very emotional experience. Uh, 135 was incredible. That was just, just, just incredible. So let me use that segue uh, to bring Tony Rice back in. Uh, Tony, I'm going to one of my uh, one of these uh, NASA social events. The my first one. They've obviously held several since uh, 2011, before and after then. What should I expect at this national social event? And in turn, what can all of our followers expect to see through the lens of my camera? Before I answer your question, I got to share my 135 experience oh, as well. Sure, please. I was not down at Kennedy. Uh, I was actually at the Wright Brothers Memorial. So I got to see the last space shuttle launch literally yards away from where the Wright Brothers first took flight. And that was a pretty incredible experience. So what we did was um, uh, we worked it out with the Park Service ahead of time. I stuck literally my tailgating rig with my direct TV receiver and such in the back of my car and, and drove out to, to Kitty Hawk, um, crammed it in the sand there, got a good signal, and we were watching it inside of the temporary hangar that was set up for the anniversary uh, celebrations a few years earlier for first flight. And the, I just can't say enough about the, the park rangers there. They're amazing. Uh, they should be teaching aerospace classes with some of the, the history and just the, the physics of flight and the way they describe wing warping, for example, uh, with some of the, the nice rigs they have down there uh, is just amazing. And, and they were telling me it was one of the biggest crowds that they had outside of that um, anniversary 
uh, of course, but you know, same experience. We had people that were uh, in tears. We had, you know, bikers that, you know, just showed up there uh, to see the memorial and hadn't realized that there was something like that going on, you know, hanging on every word uh, as the countdown was going on, along with families. And, you know, there was hundreds of people there. It was, it was an absolutely amazing experience. Now, not to, to segue back into your question, uh, does it touch what Jared experienced and doesn't touch what you're about to experience down there? Uh, so you shared the, um, uh, the itinerary with me and I can read a couple of things off there and give you a, a little bit to, uh, to get you that much more excited uh, going okay. down there. So based on what they told you about where you might be able to eat lunch. Um, <laughs> Wait, that's they, they that's how cryptic we're getting on this email. I'm loving this insight. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, so you will likely be in the operations support building, which is uh, you know, go in and pull up not the Kennedy Space Center visitor complex map, but the Kennedy Space Center visitor map, the one that is intended for contractors and such. They're coming on. Everything has a building number because this is the federal government. Uh, and most everything is built there is, you know, cinder block walls with white paint on it. Uh, very military looking, except for the OSB. The OSB is nice. You're, you're going to be in a nice building there. It is adjacent to the turn building. It is right by the press site. So I would suspect that you're probably going to be seeing this launch from that same position, the press site where that countdown clock is. And hey, they got a new countdown clock. It's not the uh, the digitally one with the, the numbers that roll. It's an actual video screen. Um, the, the old one is outside of the a visitor complex. So if you do get a chance to, to go to the visitor complex, notice that. So the uh, the, the two choices there were Sonny's Barbecue, which is a, a Florida chain, and then they mentioned Subway as well. Uh, Sonny's Barbecue is in the OSB. It's down on the ground floor. Um, the other one, um, the, the Subway, is in a, a cafeteria uh, near the VAB, next door to the VAB. So that's where you're, you're going to be having lunch where uh, all the, the all the Kennedy Space Center employees have, and, and just to, to kind of tantalize you a little bit, keep your eyes out when you're you know out and about, and, and on, of course on the bus tours they're going to take you on, and that sort of thing. When you mentioned when I saw Subway on there, it reminded me of the last time I was standing in line at that Subway next to the VAB, and I turn around behind me, and it's the Kennedy Space Center director Bob Cabana. And he's in line with everybody else. Nobody goes and gets his lunch. He, he goes down there and gets his lunch just to, like everybody else. Had a nice little conversation with them. He, uh, you know, he thanked us for, for coming down and, and checking out the launch. Meanwhile, I'm super thankful for having the opportunity to, to go and check these things out. But that's one thing, you know, little, little inside baseball thing for you there. Um, if I had the choice, um, I, I love me some good barbecue. But it's so cool to, to go into that company cafeteria next to the VAB because they've got tons of pictures up on the wall, all autographed with uh, uh, with the different crews. And there's just tons of really cool memorabilia just in the dining area of, of that subway. So I'm, I'm envious that you get to go down there and check that out. Here is the uh, countdown clock you mentioned from the Crew 5 launch. You can see it in the uh, still video here. But um, I think that is like beyond inside baseball, Tony. And I think that's why we love you. <laughs> Just to let I've been to a know, couple of these things, so that caught my eye. The itinerary they sent me doesn't have any buildings or addresses on it besides where to go to security to get clocked they in. They will take you and everywhere you need to go. And Tony did all of that just based off of the two lunch choices they gave me. That is, <laughs> that is incredible. And I will also mention, um, you were in line to get food and saw the uh, Kennedy Space Center director. I was once in line to get breakfast at the Marriott in D.C. across from NASA headquarters, and Buzz Aldrin was getting his scrambled eggs. That's a good place to spot astronauts, definitely. Yes. And you revealed another one of my secrets there. Oh, there we go. I'm going to retitle this podcast, uh, the Tony Rice uh, Secrets. Um, this is going to be, I think, really incredible. I want to remind folks who are maybe just coming into Carolina Weather Group that we're going to try to take as many pictures and videos and sounds as we can. And then when we do our live launch coverage on Sunday night, we're going to play back a lot of those. So wherever you are watching or listening to us right now, stay subscribed because we will have that coverage 
to follow. Also probably worth mentioning, Jared, I'm going to hit the button, but we could use a little gas money. We've launched the new Carolina Weather Group merch store. So if you want a hat or a mug or a water bottle or something to that extent, uh, there is a link in the description wherever you're watching or listening to it. This is kind of a really cool way. Uh, we have a lot of folks who already support the show on Patreon. You can continue to do that at patreon.com slash Carolina Weather Group. But if you would like something you can actually hold in your hands for that support and wear this gear, it is now available at the new Carolina Weather Group merch store. So we are happy to have launched that. Let's bring Frank straight into the conversation here for a moment, if I can. Carolina Weather Group panelist in Columbia on this Wednesday night. We're still several days away from launch, but let's get an early preview with Frank. How's the weather looking for the launch here? 1.45 a.m. on Monday. It's actually looking not not too bad at this point, James. Uh, we'll take a look real quick here at uh, some computer models. I've got the uh, European uh, model here from our friend uh, Levi Cowan's site, uh, tropicaltidbits.com. And uh, I have this uh, set to the current time. And uh, right now we have a cold front that's actually approaching us here in the Carolinas from the west. It's causing some uh, shower and thunderstorm activity. Earlier there was some severe weather in the middle Mississippi Valley, but uh, that since has subsided. And uh, that front, uh, the uh, precipitation with it sort of uh, wanes as it approaches us over the uh, coming days. Oops, let me get that out of the way. Now I can advance things forward. Uh, that was the current time, and I've advanced this uh, through the day tomorrow. Another warm day ahead of that front here in the Carolinas as that uh, front approaches, and uh, the uh, shower activity kind of uh, fades as it moves into the western Carolinas there tomorrow. But uh, on Friday, the front uh, does move through. Uh, it looks as though, however, it uh, becomes stationary uh, just to our south, but uh, well north of the uh, of the Space Coast there in Florida. So uh, that front uh, looks like it won't be much of a factor as we go through the day Saturday. A wave of uh, cool rain uh, pushes through the Carolinas. You're actually kind of chilly up in North Carolina. Temperatures will probably be in the 40s, but it should stay uh, nice and warm uh, down in Florida as a little weak area of low pressure passes by to the north. And and uh, as we go through the day Sunday, that front starts actually retreating northward as a warm front. So warm air surges into South Carolina, eventually North Carolina. And this is roughly the time of launch here. Uh, we have high pressure uh, centered over Cuba and uh, ridging northward into Florida and the Bahamas. So that should promote quiet weather at about uh, 145 a.m. Uh, Monday morning. And uh, things are probably looking pretty good. I looked at some of the expanded uh, model data, and there uh, is going to be some high cloudiness over the area. I don't think that will have a whole lot of effect on the, the launch, uh, but uh, it looks like uh, probably fairly good viewing conditions, uh, not much in the way of clouds, and uh, winds don't look too uh, strong either. It looks like we'll have a uh, light westerly wind there uh, for the launch uh, early in the morning on Monday. Thank you, Frank, and I will continue to pray to the weather gods that we continue to have good weather. This uh, launch period had a late Saturday night, late Sunday night, late Monday night uh, launch possibilities. They've already chosen to forego Saturday nights. We're going to hopefully get Sunday nights in, and then Monday nights will be the next one before they get a little bit of a rest period uh, out of that uh because it's going to be very tiring for everybody. So uh, in terms of uh, packing my patience, as Tony told me to do at the beginning of the show, I will have to be sure to uh, to do that so that hopefully we can get it in in this uh, three-day window. Uh, using that weather segment as a, a segue, let's go down to Myrtle Beach. Carolina with group panelist Scotty Powell is there. Scotty, uh, tomorrow, Thursday, could be, at least here in Charlotte, the warmest February day in recorded Charlotte history. What can we expect around the Carolinas for this early flirt with spring? Yeah, we're we're, we're doing that here too. Uh, I believe Florence and Lumberton, both at 84 degrees, 83, 84 degrees uh, is the record for the warmest February day on record. Uh, right now, we're expected to be like 85, 86 in Florence and Lumberton. So we should... Uh, see those records fall. We saw a few records tied today uh, in both of those areas. Here along the coast, we stayed in the upper 60s. We got to 71 today before the sea breeze kicked in, but I think tomorrow we're not going to have the sea breeze to worry about as we have more of a southwesterly wind, and that is expected to bump our temperatures even here along the coast until about 80 degrees. Um, Jared, I'm, I'm sure you guys may have not got the full blunt of the sea breeze today, but I know uh, it, it's still been kind of toasty uh, for this week. And I don't know about you. I would assume what I'm about to say is 
the same thing for you, but we are literally swimming in pollen right now up here. <laughs> the pollen so is bad. <laughs> so thick. It looks like it's snowed yellow dust out there. <laughs> so not only are we having hot temperatures, but a lot of pollen as well here in the Grand Strand. Can confirm my black SUV looks like a school bus at this point. Um, you know, I mean, we down here in Charleston, just speaking for us yesterday, we broke a record. Um, the 83 yesterday was high 82 today, tied a record. Uh, we've been setting the, the other part of this too, is that we have been setting, you know, kind of pretty good, uh, record low Mac record high minimum temperatures there. I always get that backwards for some reason, really uh, warm, low temperatures. Yeah. We, we, <laughs> Put it this way, we have had lows that are closer to the normal highs for this point in February uh, during this warm spell. And I'll tell you what, that that subtropical ridge, I mean, I could go on for hours about this. We don't have time. James is going to get murdered if I'm not careful. But um, but I'll tell you, that subtropical ridge is summer-like, incredibly strong. I mentioned that on air today. I said if we were in May or June, we oh, would God. be in the hundreds in a lot of yeah. places so. yeah it would be simmering for sure yeah and 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 if we weren't and if it and if we didn't have the subtropical ridge there and we actually had the cool air in place we might be talking about freezing rain tomorrow or saturday mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> with the way that wedge set up <laughs> and then the moisture going atop it um it is amazing how many close calls we've had that would have been perfect winter storms we had that upper low a couple weeks ago and now this uh that would have been perfect for winter weather except you don't have the cold. You don't have the winter. So rain it is. Yeah, it is. Uh, I'm just I'm pulling for the heat now. I'm like, if we can get these leaves out, we can get this pollen over with. So let, let's let's go ahead and just get that knocked out. <laughs> yeah, I did a little uh, yeah. climatology also for Charleston, and this will be only the fifth February since records began in 1938 that we will not record a temperature below freezing. In the wow. month of February. Now, two out of those four months, there was a killing freeze in March. One of them, 2017, a very, very bad killing freeze. Yeah. So don't we, get we, too excited about planting. Don't, yeah. Don't plant we, yet. We've had a few people ask us, you know, and like, listen, you, you know, the numbers always sway that we're going to have at least one more cold spell um, before, before we have the big final warm up. So. Uh, we're coming up on time here, so let me show this here before we go. Uh, Jared put this in our back channel, and I don't know if he meant for me to share it or not, but I'm doing it anyway. How did Evan Fisher get to this launch in 2011? That, <laughs> all that hair looks just like Evan Fisher. Yeah, there was uh, there was a time when my hair follicles were working properly, but uh, yeah, but that was um, that was right after that. You, you can see the clouds in the background. That was right after that terrible downpour. Uh, we were worried that we weren't going to be able to get back out to the uh, get back out to see the uh, rss retraction there and we did we got to see it um on 39a we were standing right across from it they opened it as we were out there it was so cool it was so cool we just got a lot of really good luck on that uh on that social i feel like just the clouds parting at the right time weather clearing up just at the right time like it's just like somebody wanted that to go off okay and uh god that was so much fun Hope I have that same someone watching over me this weekend, Tony. Um, this is going to be, I think, super exciting. I, I'm excited, and I hope our viewers are excited to to get to see a lot of this. Um, closing thoughts from you tonight, Tony, as we head into this launch weekend. Three things: bring that picture back up, please. Oh, oh show you okay. Cool. You'll uh, hear the story. Gonna, when you are you going to tell me what he had for lunch? No, <laughs> I'm going to show you something cool on this. Um, okay. And they'll probably uh, point this out because we will definitely be at least taking the bus around um, this launch pad here. Uh, you see that fence? You know, that, that's a, obviously a security fence outside of the um, the perimeter of the, the launch pad. Uh, that's what's known as a gator fence. Uh, it is curved outwards. So if the gators try to uh, climb it, um, you know, their own body weight will cause them to, to fall. That's the story. I don't know how true it is. You will definitely hear that story when you're down there. You will probably see gators. Uh, that's a national wildlife refuge. So yeah, just something to keep an eye out for while you're on the tours and such. Look for the critters. Uh, you'll see armadillo. Uh, they'll probably point out there used to be a bald eagle's nest that was not far from the VAB out on the main road there. 
Uh, they had vacated that for a while. I understand there's a new nest there, so I'm sure they'll point that out. It's just a gorgeous, gorgeous place. Um, I sent you a link um, mm -hmm. in, in the chat here. Um, I encourage you not to open it until you get down there because you won't get in the car tonight. You'll be too <laughs> busy digging into this. It is um, KSC... Uh, kscweather.ksc.nasa.gov and there's Sorry, just a ton it. yeah and don't click on nothing uh because each one of those is a deep link into live data in a lot of cases so uh have that on your phone when you're sitting there fretting seeing uh you know lightning on the horizon because uh, i'm sure you'll have up uh goes and you'll have up the um the melbourne weather radar uh but this is another bit of data for you to be obnoxious and uh, share your weather knowledge with your your fellow uh NASA social folks. Uh, and the last bit of advice I'll give to you is you're going to have your phone, you're going to have your camera and all that down there. When it actually comes launch time, uh, if it's not on a tripod, put it down uh, and, and watch the launch and enjoy the launch. Uh, there's going to be a lot of people that will take, be taking some very good pictures. Uh, so don't feel like you have to capture those for yourself. And you really want to experience it, uh, especially the uh, um, the Falcon 9 is not as big of a, a vehicle as the shuttle was. The shuttle is such a huge vehicle, and there's so much fire coming out of the business end of that rocket. You can feel the heat. I don't think you'll quite experience that, maybe since uh, it'll probably be cool with temperatures. But one thing to pay attention to is you'll really get an understanding of how much faster light is than sound. You're going to see that thing launch an uncomfortable amount of time before you actually hear it launch, because you're going to be a good three miles away. No, so it'll be something like 15 seconds then before you hear the noise, right? Somebody did the math in his head. Yeah. <laughs> we keep him around. It's fine. He's smart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can't confirm. It's, 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 it's uncanny. Uh, it, it, you have to experience it. I'm very glad that you're going to get to. I really appreciate your last point, Tony, because I've been struggling with that knowing that my phone is going to be what I'm live streaming with and that I'm going to be by myself in terms of, I'll have the other NASA social attendees, but I'm not going to have a Carolina with a group person with me. Like how much stuff do I want to lug? And I'm like, oh, I could bring another camera, but like, I don't really have a telephoto. Like what? I, I fear that when it launches, I'm going to regret not watching it with my eyes or not recording. Don't watch it through camera. a viewfinder. I will watch it with my eyes then. There we go. I'm deciding that right here, right now. Take tripods. <laughs> I'm bringing a big ring light. It's going to be a whole thing. It's going to be great. And hopefully uh, you all at home will join us for this experience uh, currently scheduled to stream your way right here Sunday night. If that changes, I'm sure you'll find that information on Twitter because whether it's a NASA social or a NASA tweet, tweet up, I'm going to do lots of tweeting. The SpaceX right, well, this... CEO thanks you. Yes, he does. I'm going to use lots of SMS second step authentication. That was an inside tech joke. Jared is laughing off screen. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, uh, thank you, Tony, for all of that insight. I uh, look forward to continuing to uh, talk with you. Uh, this is going to be super exciting. Uh, by the way, if anybody didn't know this yet, Tony's awesome because he's always available to come on and talk with us. And while I've been blown away by his knowledge previously, I will forever remember the moment that he was able to identify what building we were in based on the restaurants there. <laughs> so uh, that does it for this edition of the Carolina Weather Group. Please just, stay tuned, stay subscribed, and just Frank, text yes, us if or text us text us if you're at Subway or Dickie's Barbecue. We'll know. <laughs> yes, you have to follow me on Twitter to find out exactly <laughs> which restaurant to decide and who I see there. And what they get order. it at Dickie's and take it over to the cafeteria. There you go. That's your move. All right. There we go. I'm going to leave it there. Uh, I'll have this with me to uh, take some weather ops, uh, at least where I'm standing at surface level, uh, come launch time. And I hope uh, to see you all back here for that Carolina Weather Group live coverage of NASA's SpaceX Crew 6 coming your way. Fingers crossed this weekend, wherever you are currently watching this episode. For now, I'm James Briarton on behalf of the entire Carolina Weather Group. We will see you soon from Florida. Have a good night.